Jay McLean of Danville, California, is going to read an excerpt from the honorable mention novel, Ship of State. This is the story of an 11-year-old boy who sails away from home on a ship of lost children. In chapter one, Mira is on a field trip to the poet Robertson Jeffers house with his eight classmates from Big Sur, his father, his teacher, Miss Winston, and his four-year-old deaf-mute brother. Curious about a strange little boat he's seen out in the sea, Mira climbs the 20-foot tower next door. He's been warned not to climb. On the stairs below footsteps, someone's climbing up. He keeps his eyes on the stone floor below the steep steps. His brother crawls from the dark hole of the passageway and looks up. Don't come up here, Christopher. His brother grabs the first step. No, go back. He shouts because his brother can read his face and temperament better than anyone who possesses words. And he's small for his age and quick, despite his sweet, dreamy nature that makes him appear sleepy. And he understands his older brother is slow to anger. But Christopher keeps coming, one short leg over each large rock, until he grabs him by the collar of his jacket and yanks him to the top and deposits him on the floor. Kneeling down, he stands his brother up and brushes off the front of his jacket. You can't always come with me. The little creep smiles at him. It's too steep for you. Hang on to the sides. High voices and laughter float up the tower. He puts Christopher down and crosses to the other side and watches Robbie and Serena, Robbie's older sister, Alita, who's also in their class, head his way. The other kids turn the corner of the main house and return to the garden. His pockets are stuffed with abalone shells and large pebbles. He picked up on the pathway below, because you never know when you might need them. A man can never have too many weapons. He crouches behind the wall. His brother squats too. Removing a fistful of shells and stones from his pocket, he waits when he hears talking and shoes scuffling below the tower. He stands, leans over the side, and launches the missiles onto Robbie Cruz's head. Shrieks and squeals erupt as he ducks, followed shortly by pebbles and shells and sticks clearing the tower wall. Grabbing more projectiles from his pocket, he gets up and flings them down. Faces look up, contorted with laughter. A little stream of blood is dribbling down Serena's left cheek. He's laughing as he hides, barely able to scrape together another round of ammunition from his stash. And his brother's laughing too. Silently, his mouth open, the dimples of his cheeks growing deeper, his shoulders growing up and down. Some of the kids are already climbing the outside steps, and he waits as his enemies gather stones that are more like rocks when they sail over the wall. Also arrives a small tree branch, a cocoa mug, an assortment of cookies, and a lone pocket knife he recognizes from the inlaid pearl on the handle as Jason Holling days. Although he rises to deliver what's left in his pocket, Miss Winston, his father, and the poet's son are running toward the tower. It's over. He uncurls his fist in stone and shells fall to the floor. He turns to grab Christopher and head down the stairs. His brother is not there. For a moment he's confused. Maybe he's gone down. And his eyes sweep the corners and shadows of the area at top before he sees the little figure on the other side of the tower. He's perched between two turrets and he's staring at the boat, his small heart-shaped face still, his olive complexion shiny in the moonlight. Something hot and cold goes through Muir and travels to his fingertips, which make them tingle. His throat grows tight, and he momentarily freezes into the stone. He spurts to the other side. His brother stands up, leans forward, and stretches his right arm toward the sea. The boat hovers on twindles of fog. A light twinkles, then it goes out. Christopher, he says, or thinks he says, but his brother doesn't hear him and holds on to her turret with his left hand and leans far over the edge of the tower. Or maybe he didn't say anything because his brother, who's acutely sensitive to vibration and touch, doesn't seem to feel Mirror's fingertips on his jacket and never turns his head before he disappears in the dark. 